Hello, I'm Daniel Browning. Eating good nutritious food is essential for growing healthy bodies. Poor diet leads to chronic disease and is a contributing factor to the life expectancy gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. We know that if we can improve nutrition in pregnant mothers and young kids, our people will be healthier. A balanced, healthy diet combined with regular physical activity and no smoking helps us all to live longer. In this program, we'll look at three great projects that are helping to improve nutrition in Aboriginal communities. Tucker Buddies is a school-based program in Bulla in the Northern Territory. Who's your favourite Tucker Buddy? Put your hand up if you got a favourite. In northern New South Wales, the Balganaru Medical Aboriginal Corporation provides subsidised fruit and vegetables, health checks and nutrition education to families. At the Kimberley Training Institute in Broome, they're organising horticultural courses to assist with the establishment of community gardens. We'll also talk to Professor Lisa jackson Porva and Anthea Fawcett. Let's go first to Buller a remote Aboriginal community west of Catherine to see what the Catherine West Health Board, the community and the local school are doing to improve the diet and the health of their kids. There's a lot of challenges trying to develop any kind of program, especially in remote communities. If you don't have the relationships with the community members, the program is not going to succeed. Some of the main reasons why the Tucker Buddies program developed here at Buller School is concerns from the actual parents as well as community members and the school about the balance and adequacy of the dietary intake of the school aged kids here. When, when I was a kid my father, my mother used to um, hunt for all the healthy food in the, in the ground and you know pick up some uh, yams or whatever. And that wasn't, um, you know, bad food. It was very healthy. That's the reason all the people in my days, they were very healthy. Chronic disease in Aboriginal communities is really high. And one of the main reasons why we're targeting nutrition is to help them to keep their diabetes under control so that people who have got the genetics to get diabetes will not get it so early in life. So you guys have all got your drink bottles and filled up your drink bottles today? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. What I want you to do then is I want you to get out your Tucker Buddies book, please. I would like you to get a coloured pencil and quickly colour in if you've had your fruit and your water on the Monday. If you've had your fruit and water on the Tuesday. The Tuggerbuddies program kind of initially started with the workbook, which is the resort, main resource they use, um, which is also burnt onto a CD for the teachers to use as a, an education resource in the school. Read the words. The cutouts really work well. The kids can see the corn, the cheese, the eggs. They can see the fish and think, oh, is that an everyday food? Or is it a sometimes food? And that's really great for these kids because instead yeah. of seeing words, it's all visual. Yeah. And it's fantastic for that. The kids really love the fruit mascots that they came up with. They like seeing that their ideas have been put into the book. Fruit and water. A lot of the kids have been involved with the whole development side of things. So as part of their art program at the school, they drew a lot of pictures around potential characters to represent the Tucker Buddy program. So through that, we, we came up with our five Tucker Buddy characters. Each of the kids have got a favourite character that they can identify with. Who's your favourite Tucker Buddy? Put your hand up. Peter the Peter the Parrot. Banana. Bendy Banana. They're constantly asking us when is fruit coming because they know that they get it at recess. It's great to see them sitting down waiting and enjoying every bit of fruit that we give them. A lot of the people here in the Buller community all grew up at a Vern station and back in the old days their diet used to be beef, bread, damper and potatoes and that's actually filtered through to the younger generation and now it's slowly changing. We've got a better range, a better variety and people are starting to taste different foods and they're adapting to it. So we thread the chicken and then we can get zucchini. 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 Then we get chicken. chicken. And then we get onion. onion. And then chicken. 
Radio. I think the kids have definitely, you know, learned a lot more about different types of vegetables and um, ingredients that they can use for cooking. And they bring those skills home as well and share those with the rest of their family. So hopefully that message is getting true to their parents as well. How does it make us feel when we eat this food? Yummy. Strong. Healthy. Healthy. Energy. Energy. Gives us energy. That's right. And what do we need energy for? for running, running, around. running around and doing stuff. Yep. And what about at school? So running work. Lessons. Work. Good boy, Levessa. That's right. Having that constant flow of nutrition education every couple of weeks has really made nutrition a kind of priority or a focal point within the community. When we started the Tucker Buddies program, we did notice there was a high rate of consumption of fizzy drinks. Have you noticed yeah. any? They drink a lot more water. They've got their own ones with their names on them. So every single kid's got one, so, so it's fantastic. So they have them in their classroom? Or yeah, just sitting on the desk every day. It keeps them rehydrated, especially in this weather up here in the Northern Territory. They're constantly drinking and it stops them from needing that fizzy drink. So all of the answers we need to know are going to be down here. Through interviews with the teachers, um, they said they've noticed um, improvements in concentration and behaviour where the kids after their lunch break um, are coming back a lot more ready and concentrating in class. Right up the top, up here. So can you tell me what you, anything you've learned about food labels? Mm -hmm. Ingredient list. Oh. Ingredients list. What the kids eat now will undoubtedly impact on their state of health later in life. So developing good eating habits and making those informed choices around healthy food is definitely all part of the, the growth and development of a child. Lisa jackson Pulver, welcome. Thank you. Well, what do you think are the good things about the Tucker Buddies project? Hey, it's about kids. And kids are great influencers. They go home and they share with their parents and, and their family members and community what they've learned at school and something that is so engaging and so full of colour and life and story and song is sure to get the attention and attraction of people at home. What do you think then are some of the challenges though for people in remote communities accessing good food? It's really tough when you're uh, looking at sometimes the most remote communities in the world um, and we somehow manage to get frozen food there, uh, junk food, that it's in perfect shape. But when it comes to getting a few head of broccoli and some tomatoes, it just seems utterly impossible. It's critically important that we support the message of, of fresh is best, um, as well as supporting the message that bush tucker has supported people for 60,000 plus years. Now, people were not nutritionally disadvantaged in those early days. We need to start taking some lessons from the land. Thanks, Lisa. Now let's see what the Balganaru Aboriginal Medical Corporation is doing to improve the health and nutrition of families in the Clarence Valley in New South Wales. Fresh fruit and vegetable boxes, advice on cooking and nutrition, and regular health checks make the difference. The fruit and vegetable program was established initially uh, as a sort of school-based program out at, uh, at Bayougal, which is sort of a small Aboriginal community school about 80 kilometres away from Grafton. When we looked at the diet of the children who were attending the school, there was about 20 children there, all Aboriginal children, the, their diet was fairly poor. So we decided to do some studies and we found that they were, every child was deficient in vitamin C and about 75% were deficient in iron as well. Initially it was sort of school, there was fruit at the school and then there was a sort of meals that were offered at the school and, and a, a, a garden that was developed. So it was a whole sort of nutritional uh, package at the school and it seemed to make a big difference to the kids' health um, in over a you know, six to 12 month period. As a result of the success of that, it was expanded to the other um, communities that we serve, the towns in the Clarence Valley, Grafton, McLean, Yamba. It was much more difficult to target the children because they're only a small percentage of the, uh, the children at each of the um, schools in, in those towns. And so then it sort of changed to become a family-based um, fruit and vegetable um, subsidy program. G'day, Deb. 
How are you going today? Good, thanks. Got your box ready out the back. Beautiful. Another nice day coming in. So we identify people who seem to have the most need from a health um, perspective, but also from a you know, nutritional and, and a financial perspective, you know, are most likely to benefit from a program such as this. Hang on, Debbie, you here to fix up your AMS? Yes, thanks. As part of the program, they, have, they come and they have a health assessment, and while they're having health assessments, they'll also have you know, hearing checks if, uh, if they're indicated they haven't been done. Hello. Hello, And also we have a dentist here, so we're able to sort of offer dental uh, checkups as well. So they have dental checkups. You know, we have dietitians who work here, and so we can refer them to the dietitians. Uh, I also am doing a PhD, looking at specifically at the fruit and vegetable program and an evaluation of that. We try to do some kind of short program in each community in the Clarence Valley uh, at some time through the year. So this group uh, in McLean, we have a lot of the elders come and some of the younger people drop in as well. We'd like to get more of the younger people coming in, uh, especially the mums with young children. We provide you know, lots of healthy ingredients, so there's usually lots of vegetables and fruit and we try and um, promote some of the healthier cooking methods or we might try to change some old favourites. So I just love it. And it's good time to myself, because when you've got three kids you don't have time to yourself. And sometimes when they want to help it's good for them. And it gets them interested in healthy eating too, especially when the veggies. I know my daughters, they're cooking with this now, the bok choy and things like that, and they're experimenting. So I think the more that we can get into like schools and teach our children, because then it, this becomes a part of their life. Okay, what have we got today? Today we're going out to Bayugal School and we're going to be cooking with the children out there. Since we started the nutrition program we've noticed dramatic improvements in their health so we want to maintain those improvements and each week um, Carol, one of the teachers, cooks a healthy lunch on a Tuesday. They will try different things if we encourage them and the, the staff at the school are very good at encouraging them. When I asked them in previous sessions if they cook at home, they all say that they do help out at home. Una, could you please wash this lettuce for me? I've been a doctor for 30 years. It's the most dramatic thing that I've seen in my medical career in terms of a simple intervention providing such a great health outcome. Doc couldn't believe it because no more scripts had to be written out. This program could go into any other schools that have got Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal kids that have got problems with their skin sores, uh, ears, uh, the runny noses. The kids are interested in getting in and planting some veggies. If we can grow our own here and use that, it's, uh, it's also a good skill that the kids can learn. In terms of, of the outcomes, there are a number of things that we found. We did blood testing and, and sort of diet histories which showed that the children's nutrition seemed to improve while they were on the program. In the sort of short term, there were 30 to 50 percent decreases in the rates of attendances to, uh, to the hospital emergency department um, in terms of skin infections and, um, and in terms of the numbers of antibiotics that, uh, that were prescribed. We think you know, these are um, not just statistically significant but also clinically relevant uh, improvements in the children's health. Can I have an apple? Yeah, can you get me one too, please? Lisa, do you think Bulga Nauru is heading in the right direction? Absolutely. They are taking advantage of a few really important things. Number one, the passion and the understanding of the local Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Service about the needs of their people. Two, they're taking can, uh, understanding and knowledge from the school about what the kids need. And three, they're taking on board the passion of the children to uh, uh, keep energetic and enthused and engaged with a program like the fruit and vegetable campaign. 
More generally, what do you think needs to be done now to improve our health, to improve our nutrition? What we do know, the evidence suggests that if kids are engaged in healthy life practices and healthy life choices really, really early, they will continue through that. We know that the program Bolga Nauru works. Okay? Rolling that out into other contexts is not rocket science. It's a really simple thing to do. Anything from uh, breakfast programs to kids before school all the way through to the fruit and vegetable uh, program once a week for families. You have to engage the kids but at the end of the day it's the community that benefits because you just can't feed the kids and not the families at home in the community. And what, why do you think Balganaroo works so well? Why is it a success? Oh, it's simple. It's a community controlled organisation that's very, very connected and embedded in its community. It listens very strongly. It's all about the people saying this is what we want and the community controlled organisation saying yes, here's a need, let's do it. Thanks Lisa. Now let's look at an education program that addresses the availability of fresh food in remote communities. The horticulture courses run in Broome teach students about growing fresh food and cultivating nutritious bush tucker. The courses develop gardening skills and aim to establish sustainable food enterprises in remote communities. Well, I think it's been recognised for quite a few years now that um, we've got diet-related health problems in remote communities, we've got all sorts of social problems out there with people needing to do things, and uh, we could see as horticulturists, I guess, as gardeners, that. Uh, setting up food gardens was, was an answer. So we run a horticultural training program which includes certificates one through to four, a very practical training program which is all about encouraging the growth and the development of community food gardens, and fresh food gardens, particularly uh, geared towards remote Aboriginal communities. This is the Kelvin tree, it's, in new, it's flowering our new season, new flowers. When we started doing it, there was this feeling that no, you can't grow food in remote communities, it's too hard. We tried to do it before, uh, you know, the plants weren't watered and they died. But um, that to me was, was a challenge because you know, we've got wonderful technology of irrigation, automatic watering systems. So through training, we were able to install those sort of watering systems, demonstrate that yes, you can grow things, and, and that was one of the more satisfying parts of it all. So just patience. Take your time, it's no rush. We've got a number of students that have maintained a long-term association with us. Meridu Walbadi is one who's there now from Bidjadanga. He's a, a, one of the last of the traditional people to come out of the Great Sandy Desert. And he's really embraced this, which has been very, very encouraging for us to have traditional people really embrace it and support what we're doing. Thousands of thousands of years, people were living in the, the fruit they till today. And that tree over there is always a healthy tree. And you know, you know they always healthy tree. You live off the land, you live of live of here. Hey, food. Uh, they're always healthy and you don't get diabetes or whatever, kidney or heart. That's and that's what our that's what our main aim is, you know, that's showing our young ones. You know, we don't we don't want to see our young generation or anyone stuck up in that's in that, you know, get up and end up with that. Have a look, Mary. Is that, is that your little sugar bag bees or what? Yeah, sugar bag. This is basically a taster. It's not, not a big area at all. It's only less than an acre. But it's a model of what people can do. So we've got a range of uh, local bush plants. We've got mangoes. We've got uh, all sorts of fruit and veggies that, that we rotate through the year. A lot of the green leafy stuff during the dry season. Peas, beans, corn, sweet potatoes. You, you might come here, pick up food, what food you look at, always fresh. You know, not, doesn't, it doesn't, what, we, what they grow here doesn't get on but a month and people can just come and get food and take them home and, you know, they're healthy, you know. We'll show you how to grow your conventional fruit and veggies, but we also started working with the traditional people who were telling us about their traditional plants. So growing the gubbins has been a really remarkable story because we started growing a few here and there and then in the meantime uh, this great interest came through with gubbins, research by the CSIRO confirmed its wonderful nutritional value, its wonderful uh, antioxidant levels. So we had this uh, thing, suddenly we found ourselves in the right place at the right time having 
pioneered the cultivation of this bush fruit and suddenly it was something that everyone wanted more of. So this is another great uh, success for us in that we're doing a, a culturally appropriate plant, working together with Indigenous people in, in an area that's really presenting some great commercial potential. Something to put them in the ground and land and you. And I was like, yeah, and I like the other mob, get what they, what I achieve myself. And I'm proud of it. You know, working through what it called and tape, it's plenty to do. This is an answer, and to really make it go and to really make it work, we've got to create jobs in communities. We've got to create businesses. I mean, remote communities spend a fortune on bringing in fruit and veggies that's poor quality, very expensive. So we need that, we need people to sort of see that and to really recognise this as a way of doing something useful and positive. Now you can't expect people who are just working for the doll to keep going year after year, which is what's been happening, not getting any real jobs out of it. So we need to create positions where, where people who we train can go back to a community and get a paid job and then we can keep supporting them. That's the missing link at the moment. But we really embrace that whole idea and there's no reason why communities right across Australia can't have this and, and it can't become part of the culture in years to come. And I think it will, but we've got to push it. It won't happen by itself. You know, you just, it, 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 it's step by step and you get there. Aye. Anthea Fawcett, welcome. Thanks, Daniel. Anthea, so what do you think the benefits are of these, uh, these horticulture courses? These courses are really good, I suppose, on a range of fronts. Most importantly, done in a local area with its own particular growing conditions and so on, they really demonstrate what can be grown locally and how, and they can help local people troubleshoot problems and identify what's going to work in their community, in their soils, with what types of water and other resources they've got available. So that's practically really, really important. Um, you know, these courses train local people in up-to-date, technically relevant, um, sustainable gardening and farming techniques, irrigation systems that work and that people can, be, can maintain, and that's really, really important. But I think the key, key thing is that these courses are investing in people who will be the leaders and doers in their communities in the future. And um, the local food production projects, from small to large, they have to be community-owned and community-driven. What are some of the things that can help those projects to survive, you know, in conditions that are, that are really tough in remote Australia? You've got, to, you've got to think very clearly about who, who your community is and what social and other resources it has in it and design with those. So if you're in a really arid environment, you know, set your garden expectations to match the environment and the possibilities of people going on sorry business and being away for a long time. Um, at least think gardens in two sorts of categories. Think, you know, um, the planting gardens that have perennial uh, seasonal fruits and other uh, foodstuffs on them so that once they're established they can be pretty easily maintained and there'll they'll always be something to gather from them. They're almost gathering gardens which, you know, things with traditional lifestyles. And then also think sort of shorter term cycle gardens that can be um, intensively done perhaps over a period of eight to ten weeks. Um, they grow fruit and veg, you know, deliver very particular um, produce and also learning outcomes. And then, you know, when it comes summer, you let them go and you start them up again at an appropriate time of year. So coming up with a range of uh, strategies in parallel. So Anthea, do elders have a special role to play here in local food production? Oh, they have an enormous role. Elders' knowledge is invaluable. And when you see an elder like Meridu who who absolutely understands traditional culture and plants but is really engaged with marrying that up with new, new techniques and approaches for great new activities on country. What more could you want? Anthea, thanks for joining us. We can all learn from these important projects. We can make better food choices for ourselves and our families. Eating fresh fruit and vegetables, lean meat, bush foods and drinking plenty of water will help us live longer. Let's make sure that we all eat strong.